Chapter 7 Disciplined, Not Rigid Jocko Willink Central Baghdad, Iraq, 2003 Why the hell are all the guys in that Humvee smoking? I wondered. As I glanced at the Humvee in front of me, it looked as if someone flicked a cigarette out of the vehicle, the glowing red embers creating tiny explosions against the side of the Humvee and the street around it. Then I saw another one, and another one. A few seconds later, reality hit me. Those weren't cigarette embers hitting the Humvee. They were bullets. It was the first time I had been shot at, and I didn't even know it. Our SEAL platoon was in a convoy of Humvees in central Baghdad headed toward a notoriously violent part of town. In the early days of the Iraq War, our Humvees had no armor. The vehicles had no doors and were thin-skinned. Bullets could pass right through the exterior. They were not meant for urban combat, making the incoming small arms fire a real threat. Unfortunately, we couldn't see where the enemy fire was coming from, so we did not return fire. A minute or two later, we pulled into our destination, a small outpost in north-central Baghdad. Once our convoy stopped inside the compound, a radio call came over my headset. One of my guys was hit. Over the radio, the medic asked which vehicle the wounded man was in. The call came back that the wounded man was in vehicle four. I got out of my vehicle, did a quick visual assessment of our current tactical situation. All vehicles were in line on the road on which we had driven into the compound. The road ran parallel to the nearby Tigris River to our right. We had driven past the main building in the outpost, protected by rows of large wire and fabric boxes filled with sand and gravel called HESCO barriers. The wall of HESCO barriers extended along the bank of the Tigris opposite the main building, but as the road continued past the main building, the HESCO barriers came to an end. It didn't seem like a big concern to me, as the Tigris was fairly wide and small arms would likely not be effective from the bank on the other side. Once I felt comfortable with our situation, I walked back to Vehicle 4 to check on the condition of the wounded seal. I had never had one of my men wounded before. I'd never been shot at before, nor had anyone else in the platoon. But I wasn't panicked. I knew my corpsman would quickly assess the wounded seal and begin treatment. I also knew that the 28th Combat Support Hospital, or CASH, was less than 10 minutes away and we could be there quickly if needed, just as we had briefed in our contingency planning. Luckily, it was not needed. The wound was minor. Miraculous, but minor. A single bullet, which must have been a ricochet with greatly reduced power, had hit the seal in the head, penetrating his skin, but not puncturing his skull. Instead, it had traveled in an arc around his head in between the skin and the skull. The corpsman checked the entry wound, traced it to the bullet, literally pushed the bullet along the track of the wound until it arrived at the entry point, and then simply squeezed the wound as the bullet popped out. No problem. Just as we were resolving that situation, and the corpsman was telling me that we should take him to the cache as a precaution, I heard a report over the radio. We're taking fire, someone said on our platoon inner squad radio net. I took a knee behind the Humvee, as did the rest of the guys. We listened and looked around and tried to figure out exactly what was happening. I thought I heard a couple snaps of rounds, but I couldn't tell for sure. At that point, confusion set in. I saw my guys were looking in different directions, moving from spot to spot for no reason, pointing weapons and lasers in every direction, taking cover behind all sides of the Humvees. Everyone was trying to do something, but it looked as though they weren't sure what they should be doing. This, of course, was my fault. I was the leader. I needed to give some direction. But at this point, even I was unsure what direction to give. So, I resorted to a technique I had learned from one of my old platoon commanders. When in doubt, ask. There is no shame in it especially when compared with the shame of making a bad decision because you were too egotistical to ask a question. Where's the contact? I shouted. Across the river, someone shouted back. That was good. Now we had something to work with. 
but only one person sounded off when that reply came back, which was not the way SEALs operated. In the SEAL teams, when someone gives a verbal command, everyone repeats that command to ensure that everyone gets the word. But since across the river wasn't one of our standard verbal commands, or in the standard format we used to pass information, no one repeated it. This meant that not everyone knew where the contact was. As a result, there was still confusion and lack of action with the platoon. A few SEALs had dismounted from the Humvees and taken up positions around them. Other men, including the drivers and gunners, remained inside the vehicles. I had to clear up the confusion, and fast. We were parked beyond the wall of HESCO barriers, and most of the Humvees and the men were exposed to the river and the incoming enemy fire. I needed to get them both, the vehicles and the men, behind the HESCO barriers, and I needed to do it quickly. In my mind, for a split second, I struggled to come up with a plan to make that happen. More important, I needed a method to communicate that plan over the radio so everyone would hear it. A long explanation of what was happening would be too complicated for people to pass verbally. I wasn't sure what to do. Then, I realized this was a scenario we had all seen before in training. The training scenarios had been while on foot patrol in a totally different capacity, but the same procedure could be utilized here, something everyone in the SEAL platoon knew. So I decided to use the same verbal commands that directed our standard operating procedures when we were on foot. Based on the Humvee's direction of travel, the contact was on our right. So I made the call. Contact right, I yelled. Because this was a standard call, everyone was used to hearing and repeating, everyone repeated it. Now everyone knew where the threat was. Next, I yelled, online, to get everyone's guns facing the threat. Once again, this was a standard call, and everyone repeated it as they executed the action of taking aim across the river. Within seconds, every SEAL was in position, with weapons trained on the threat across the river. Finally, I called shift right, the command to begin to move to the right based on the direction of the contact, which would move us back behind the cover of the HESCO barriers. Shift right, the platoon members repeated. Immediately, the vehicles and men began moving methodically back behind the cover of the HESCO barriers. In less than a minute, everyone was behind the protection of the HESCO barriers, and the contact was over. It hadn't been much. The incoming rounds were minimal and ineffective. We took no more casualties and none of the Humvees were hit. It was no big deal. The only reason I remember it at all is that it was my first time receiving enemy fire. But I had learned something very important. The power of disciplined standard operating procedures. I'd always been told of their importance, especially by the Vietnam-era SEALs. Now, I had experienced it firsthand. But discipline could be taken too far. While I now fully understood why disciplined standard operating procedures were important, it hadn't yet dawned on me that they could be imposed with too much discipline, too much rigidity. As task unit commander of Bruiser, I learned that lesson. We were out in the rugged desert terrain of Southern California's Imperial Valley for our first major block of training, Land Warfare. In Land Warfare, we learned to shoot, move, and communicate as a team, to close with and destroy the enemy, to cover and move, and to utilize our organic firepower to overcome enemy attacks. Land Warfare is the foundational training that all other SEAL skills are built upon. But not only was this block of training fundamental, it was also the most physically arduous. It involved long foot patrols across rough desert terrain carrying heavy loads. During immediate action drills, or IADs, predetermined and heavily rehearsed maneuver reactions that SEALs execute under enemy attack, individual SEALs, performing their role in a dynamic, coordinated scheme of maneuver, have to get up, get down, sprint, crawl, roll, jump, and dive over and over and over again. The maneuvers are physically exhausting. 
On top of this, the platoon and task unit leaders must also think. They have to assess the terrain, identify the location of enemy fire in training situations, the position of reactive targets during live fire drills, or the location of opposing force role players during blank fire drills. Leaders must quickly analyze whether to assault the enemy position or retreat. Can the opposing force be overcome, or should the SEALs break contact and depart the area? Once a decision is made between fight or flight, the SEAL leader then makes a tactical call which indicates the scheme of maneuver the SEALs will execute, much like a quarterback calling a play in a huddle. Only this isn't a huddle on a football field. This is a battlefield with lives at stake, a danger even on the training battlefield during live fire exercises. Once the call is made, the team passes the word and executes the maneuver. The maneuvers themselves are fairly mechanical, and they have to be. With live fire training, there are real bullets flying everywhere, and if a SEAL moves beyond his designated area, he could easily be killed by friendly fire. Because of this danger, the standard procedures are closely monitored by the SEAL training instructor cadre and strictly enforced. Failure to follow procedures is reprimanded with written safety violations. Any more than two or three safety violations will likely result in a Trident Review Board and possible loss of the SEAL designator. During land warfare training, the initial days of IADs are very rudimentary. The SEAL squads and platoons maneuver in simple, clearly defined and premeditated movements on open, flat, even terrain. The first iterations are done without firing weapons, so communication is clear and easily understood. The maneuvers are elemental. The leaders do not take terrain into account and simply move the pieces around a board. It is fairly simple and straightforward, allowing the SEALs to understand these standard operating procedures, which include their individual movements and how those movements fit into the overall scheme of maneuver. As soon as the dry, non-shooting IADs are solidified, the SEAL squads and platoons graduate to live-fire maneuvers. This adds a layer of challenge, as now the SEALs must listen for verbal commands over the sound of actual machine gun and rifle fire and pass those commands to the rest of the platoon. It doesn't take long to adapt. With the flat terrain, the maneuvers are fairly easy to execute. That all changes when the training cadre moves the platoons out of the flatlands and into the real terrain of the desert. Knolls, ravines, rock outcroppings, dry riverbeds, shrubs, bushes, and other common features of the semi-arid desert. Now, the leaders inside the platoon have to actually think and lead. The terrain, when read, understood, and utilized correctly, provides an unmatched advantage on the battlefield. Elevated ridgelines offer superior shooting positions. Rocks provide cover. Ravines or depressions in the terrain furnish exits that allow the platoon to escape from an enemy attack while protected from hostile fire. Once a terrain feature is identified and a plan created, the challenge is then to convey the plan to the rest of the team through verbal and visual signals, both of which become obscured by the noise, dust, and terrain itself. In Task Unit Bruiser, Delta Platoon initially had some trouble during their IADs. Once the contact started, the simulated attack initiated, the platoon got bogged down. Calls weren't being made. They would remain in position too long, expending ammunition without advancing or retreating from the enemy. This was bad. As a general rule, it was flank or be flanked. Either you maneuvered on the enemy or the enemy would maneuver on you. Stagnation on the battlefield will get you killed, and stagnating seemed to be Delta Platoon's reaction to each simulated enemy contact. As the task unit commander, I was responsible for the platoon's performance. After noticing the issue, I made a point to observe the Delta platoon commander, Seth Stone, during Delta's IAD runs. Seth was a relatively inexperienced officer. 
Like Leif, he had done a tour on a ship in the U.S. Navy surface fleet before receiving orders to BUDS, eventually going through the SEAL basic training program with Leif. They were both from the U.S. Naval Academy, both from Texas, both fans of Johnny Cash and Metallica, extremely hard workers, and very close friends. I was lucky to have them as my platoon commanders. That being said, the fact remained that they were both inexperienced. Both had graduated from BUDS only two years prior to being assigned as platoon commanders in Task Unit Bruiser, and each had completed only one pre-deployment workup cycle and one deployment to Iraq, where they spent most of their time not in the field running combat operations, but in a tactical operations center supporting missions in the field from inside the wire. I couldn't expect them to be expert tacticians based on their previous experience. I had to teach them. Seth required some help. So, I began to shadow him closely during his IAD runs. It was easy to shadow him, easier than it should have been. Seth was following the standard operating procedures without exception of any kind. Every move he was supposed to make, he made. When it was his turn to stand and move, he stood and moved to the next designated location. When it was his turn to lie down and return fire, he got down into the prone position and returned fire, like a robot. He was executing the SOPs to a T without any deviation or thought, and it was fouling him up. As a leader, you must make it part of your job to see what is coming next, to observe. By observing, leaders can understand the surroundings and the terrain. They can identify enemy positions and observe the locations of their own troops. Once leaders observe all this, they can make a call. As I observed Seth, it became clear that his mistake was following the standard procedures too closely. If, as the leader, you move and position yourself exactly as the procedure requires, you might not end up in the best spot to actually see what is happening. You might end up in a depression, or behind a shrub or a rock, which inhibits your vision, or around a corner out of sight from the rest of the platoon. As a leader, you might end up in a spot where your gunfire is providing critical cover fire for the other members of the team. So instead of leading and directing the team, you're shooting. All of these are problematic. What Seth didn't realize was that the standard operating procedures were general guidelines, not strict rules to be followed. In Seth's mind, the procedures were rigid. And while they certainly were rigid enough to ensure safety, he didn't realize that they were also extremely flexible. Of course, some parts of the procedures were not flexible at all. For instance, individuals could not move laterally down range of other shooters, or they would cut off other team members' fields of fire, or even worse, enter their field of fire and be hit by their bullets. But when behind the line of fire, individuals had the freedom to move around quite liberally, especially the leaders. Leaders could move left or right behind the firing line to observe the location of men and pass the word. They could push back even further behind the firing line to look for exits. Leaders could even grab other shooters to replace themselves in the firing line, allowing the leader to get up, move around, and look for advantageous terrain features. More important, not only could a leader do these things, a leader must do these things. To not move around, observe, and analyze in order to make the best decisions possible was to fail as a leader and fail the team. On the next I Add iteration, I told Seth I would stay by him and tell him where to move. We rolled out in patrol formation toward the area where the targets would pop up for the platoon to engage. I stuck by Seth, walking beside him but on the opposite side of his field of fire so I would not interfere with his duties. Delta Platoon patrolled down a ravine with rock and dirt embankments on both sides. This was only a training exercise. But the high-risk, live-fire drills in sweltering desert temperatures that induced sweat and fatigue 
the SEAL instructor cadre critiquing every move, the suspense of targets that popped up suddenly from unseen positions, and the pressure to make good calls all ensured that tensions were extremely high. Finally, the automated targets popped up ahead of us, and we heard the pop, pop, pop of the simulated gunfire they made. Seth hit the ground and started engaging targets, as did Delta Platoon's point man, J.P. Donnell, just in front of Seth. J.P. was an outstanding young SEAL operator, powerful in build and default aggressive to the core. J.P. was something special. Just 22 years old, he was a natural leader and always ready to step up and take charge, which he would do many times during the Battle of Ramadi. He was also extraordinarily brave, a fact that would become very clear in combat. During one serious firefight in the Malab district of eastern Ramadi, he risked his life without hesitation, running into an open street under withering enemy fire to save a U.S. Marine gunnery sergeant who had been wounded, for which J.P. was awarded the Silver Star Medal. But for now... In this training scenario, J.P. immediately opened fire with his machine gun to suppress the enemy attack. The rest of the platoon dropped into their respective fields of fire, alternating left and right through the whole patrol. Contact front, Seth shouted, alerting everyone that the enemy targets were in front of the patrol. Man by man, the rest of the platoon repeated the call, and shouts of contact front rippled down the line of men. I watched Seth. He knew that they were in a channelized area, the ravine, and with limited firepower up front and maneuverability restricted by the walls of the ravine, he made the call. Center peel, he yelled. This was the right call and really the only option in this situation. The rest of the platoon anticipated the call and quickly passed the word down the line. Center peel. With that call, Delta Platoon began the carefully coordinated drill of cover and move. As some SEALs put down heavy suppressive fire, other SEALs got up and bounded back away from the enemy contact. Everything was going well, until it was Seth's turn to move. Seth made his way down the ravine, past everyone else in the platoon, finally reaching the position where, on paper, he was technically supposed to be as dictated by the standard operating procedures. Once there, he took a knee facing the ravine wall. I watched him as he stared at the wall of rocks and dirt just feet in front of him. What can you see from here? I asked. Not much, he said, shaking his head. How can you figure out where to lead your platoon if you can't see anything? I asked him pointedly. Seth was quiet for a moment. I have no idea, he admitted. Well, then move. I told him. Now he was really confused. Move? Seth asked. The SOPs dictated where he was supposed to take up position, and in his mind, he had followed them. In his mind, he didn't have the ability to bend the rules. But those rules had left him staring at a ravine wall, unable to see anything that was happening. If he couldn't see what was happening, he couldn't lead. So I told him to break that procedure. Yes, move, I told him. What about the SOPs? Seth asked. Seth was concerned that his movement outside the norm would disrupt the flow of the maneuver. What Seth didn't understand yet was that SOPs weren't meant to be completely unalterable, especially for the leader. So I quickly explained it to him. As long as you keep within visual distance of the last man, I told him, You can move around so you can see what the hell is going on and figure out where to move next. You're the leader. You have to find an exit. As a platoon commander, one of Seth's jobs was to find an exit, a terrain feature that would allow the SEAL platoon to escape from enemy fire and mask its movement. Roger, Seth replied. He then moved another ten yards down the ravine, and as he did, another SEAL came back and filled the gap as he was supposed to. This was an inherent part of SEAL maneuvers that allowed the leader to move around, to look and see and analyze the terrain. If the leader moved from the standard position, someone else would fill his spot. 
but Seth still couldn't find an exit, and he was almost out of visual range of the last seal who had taken his previous position. I don't see anything yet, but I'm getting too far away, he observed. No problem, I countered. Wait for the next guy to come back and tell him to fill the space, then you can go farther. Seth nodded and cracked a smile at me. He was starting to understand. Leading wasn't about him following the exact procedure. It required him to think and do what made the most sense so that he could best support and lead his team. Get down there, Seth barked, pointing out a position to the next seal moving down the ravine in his direction. I'm finding an exit. The seal took a knee. Seth bumped a little farther back, scanning for an exit. Still, he saw nothing. Fill it in there, he shouted to the next man coming his way in the ravine, pointing to the general location where the seal should take position. Seth then turned again to move ahead and look for an exit to get out of the ravine. Finally, he found an exit. Another ravine broke off to the right and clearly led away from the platoon's current path of travel. It would make a good route to put distance between them and the enemy contact while protecting them from incoming fire. He took up a position at the corner of the exit. As the next man came down the ravine, Seth shouted, Exit here! Exit here! as he pointed down the ravine off to the right. The next seal followed Seth's direction, and the rest of the platoon filed by, down the new ravine and away from the enemy contact. They continued moving in the new direction for about a hundred meters. Seth looked at me. He didn't say anything, but his face was speaking loud and clear. He didn't know what to do next. Do you think you broke contact? I asked him, meaning did he think the enemy was still a threat? The guys were now moving without shooting, indicating they could no longer see the enemy, and therefore the enemy was no longer a threat. For sure, he answered. Okay, I said. So now what do you need? Seth knew exactly what I meant by that. Head count, he said. Yup. And then, I asked. Put some more distance between us and the enemy, he replied confidently. Okay then, I told him. Get it done. Roger, he replied, beginning to grasp his place as a leader with greater confidence. Seth moved ahead a little further in the patrol, now no longer bound by the standard operating procedures. He quickly found a little depression big enough to accommodate his entire platoon. He set up in the middle of it and gave the hand signal for perimeter as his men started to roll in. They saw him and immediately went to their standard assigned positions. Within a minute, all of Delta Platoon was in position, guns covering every direction. Seth received a thumbs-up signal from both squad leaders, indicating they each had a full head count. All SEALs were present and were ready to move. Seth got up, moved to JP, and gave him the signal to patrol out, away from enemy contact. In the course of a single IAD run, Seth's ability to lead had increased exponentially, and Delta Platoon's excellent performance reflected those results. Seth now understood that standard operating procedures were not fixed, inflexible laws with no room for variation. They were guidelines that needed to be balanced with adaptability and common sense. Balancing that dichotomy was required for everyone, especially leaders. When he saw Seth's signal, J.P. got up from his position in the perimeter and moved out on patrol, scanning for threats. Seth followed in just behind him, taking his position as the patrol leader. The rest of Delta Platoon got up and followed Seth, just as they would over and over again in the streets of Ramadi. Principle While discipline equals freedom is a powerful tool for both personal and team development, excessive discipline can stifle free thinking in team leaders and team members. Disciplined standard operating procedures, repeatable processes, and consistent methodologies are helpful in any organization. The more discipline a team exercises, the more freedom that team will have to maneuver by implementing small adjustments to existing plans. 
When facing a mission or task, instead of having to craft a plan from scratch, a team can follow standard operating procedures for the bulk of the plan. As SEALs, we had SOPs for just about everything we did. The way we lined up and loaded our vehicles, our vehicle and foot patrol formations, the methodologies we used to clear buildings, the way we handled prisoners and dealt with wounded SEALs, the list goes on and on. But those SOPs didn't constrain us on the battlefield. On the contrary, they gave us freedom. The disciplined SOPs were aligned to deviate from, and we had the freedom to act quickly based on those procedures. But there must be balance. In some organizations, both in the military and in the civilian sector, there are leaders who put too many standard operating procedures in place. They create such strict processes that they actually inhibit their subordinate leader's willingness and ability to think. This may adversely impact the team's performance and become a detriment to the mission, preventing effective leadership at every level of the organization. Disciplined procedures must be balanced with the ability to apply common sense to an issue, with the power to break with the SOPs when necessary, with the freedom to think about alternative solutions, apply new ideas, and make adjustments to processes based on the reality of what is actually happening. If discipline is too strict, team members cannot make adjustments, cannot adapt, and cannot use their most precious asset, their brains, to quickly develop customized solutions to unique problems for which the standard solution might not work. And when taken to an extreme, too much discipline, too many processes, and too many standard procedures completely inhibits and stifles the initiative of the subordinates. Instead of stepping up and making necessary changes, leaders confined to strict procedures will simply follow the procedures even when those procedures are obviously leading to failure. So, as a leader, it is critical to balance the strict discipline of standard procedures with the freedom to adapt, adjust, and maneuver to do what is best to support the overarching commander's intent and achieve victory. For leaders in combat, business, and life, be disciplined, but not rigid. Application to Business The VP of sales was a force to be reckoned with. She was aggressive, smart, and experienced. Having risen through the ranks, she knew the business inside and out. The company's products were solid and provided a true benefit to customers. But there was trouble in paradise. Declining sales for four straight months. The CEO decided they needed some help and reached out to Echelon Front to assess and provide guidance. As soon as I arrived, I was impressed by the VP of sales, but I could also sense her frustration. What's going on? I asked her. Not enough, she replied. Not even close. She was smiling, but she wasn't kidding. So I've been told, I said. What do you think is going on? She thought for a minute, then replied. Look, she answered. I'm not 100% sure. Last year was terrific. We couldn't seem to do any wrong. All my regional managers were driving their salespeople hard, training them well, and putting up great numbers. The frontline salespeople themselves were on fire. Well, that sounds good, I told her. It was good, she continued. Then we hit November. Usually a hard month for us. Along with December, our product is practical. Home safety, security, and efficiency, not exactly something people ask Santa for. Not exactly, I agreed. We wanted to maintain sales and profits through that time period, so we got really aggressive as a leadership team. Default aggressive, as you like to say, the VP continued. I laughed, recognizing that she understood the fundamental concepts I often spoke about. That's awesome, I told her. How exactly did you get aggressive? We got aggressive across the board, she replied. We increased our training for our salespeople, stepped up our monitoring of their calls, we tightened the pricing model to increase margin, and we started tracking and really driving the number of outgoing calls each salesperson made every day. And that didn't have an impact, I asked? Not the impact we wanted it to have, she said. 
I mean, it's hard to say. This November wasn't as bad as last November, but it wasn't near what we wanted it to be. So then what did you do? I asked. We doubled down, the VP said. You doubled down? On what? I inquired. On everything, she admitted. We improved our scripts and trained even harder on them. We had our salespeople reciting their scripts perfectly. They were all nailing it. We even went harder on our pricing to make sure that every deal we made maximized margin. And we increased the number of calls each salesperson was required to make. We cranked up the discipline across the entire sales force, she explained. And? I asked. And nothing, she said. Nothing? I asked, puzzled. Nothing, the VP declared. This December was actually worse than last year. And then, in January, things got even worse. February and March continued down, and April was one of our worst months in three years. And three years ago, we were half the size we are now. It is bad, she said soberly. And the market is good. Our competitors are doing fine, but we are losing market share. And yet our product is truly better than theirs. It just doesn't make any sense. No, it sure doesn't, I agreed. Let me do some digging. Frankly, I was a little worried that I might not be able to figure this one out. I spent the next week talking with the seven regional managers who led the sales teams. They were located in two centers, and each had sales teams of 5 to 15 salespeople. The salespeople were phone pounders, call center grinders, following leads from the internet, print ads, and mailers. They were relatively young, but also motivated. Some of them had made solid six-figure incomes from their commissions over the past several years. The regional managers, so-called because their salespeople worked particular regions of the country, were all good people, too. All of them except one had come up through the ranks of the call center. The one who hadn't was previously a customer relations representative in the field before transitioning in pursuit of a higher income. So they all knew the business, and they knew it well, from their own experience and from the tutelage of the VP of sales. I drilled down into the call centers to learn more. At one call center, I brought the four regional managers together in a meeting for some fact-finding. What do you think's going on? I asked them plainly. No idea, one of them said. None, I asked. Not really, another one replied. Any idea at all, I asked again, likely sounding pretty desperate. The group sat quietly for a little while. Finally, one of the managers spoke up. We've had many ideas, and we've hit every sales driver that we know of, the regional manager said. We thought maybe our salespeople weren't introducing the product right or overcoming objections effectively, so we really nailed down the scripting and made it bulletproof. And they all know it cold and know not to deviate from it. Then we saw they were giving away pricing too easily. They were giving discounts they didn't have to, and we were losing margins. So we tightened that up, too. They have much less leeway in pricing now. And we have increased the number of outgoing calls they have to make, and they are doing it. They are making about 30% more calls every day. They are hammering everything, but we are still losing traction. Everyone, I asked, every salesperson is going backward? Yes, every one of them, another manager chimed in. And look, we get extreme ownership. We've read the book, but I'll tell you, I think we need some new product features. We need to up our game from the technology perspective but your VP of sales told me your product is legitimately better than any of your competitors, I countered. It is, the manager said, but there's nothing new. We need something new to sell. That's what we need. I'm telling you, our sales force can't do much more than what they're doing. They are like machines out on that floor right now. I nodded. Something wasn't adding up. I couldn't quite understand what it was. All right, I told them. Let me see what I can figure out. The next day, I spent time on the front lines with the actual salespeople who made the calls. I listened in on their calls and asked them some questions. Each salesperson I listened to sounded incredibly professional and polished. Their words were scripted, but they said them so naturally that you could barely notice they were all saying the exact same thing. At first, I was impressed, really impressed. 
It seemed as if each one of these salespeople deserved an Academy Award for acting. But the Academy Award was about the only thing they were winning. I listened as salesperson after salesperson got shot down and failed to close a deal. Their introductions were smooth, but they weren't getting any traction. When they did get some interest from a potential client, most weren't able to get through the client's objections even when giving the proper scripted responses. And those who finally did get through the objections to set up a sale had a really hard time discussing pricing to close the deal. The whole morning, I saw only three deals get closed. Finally, at noon, I offered to take a few of them to lunch. We went to a burger joint, ordered our food, and sat down to wait for it. So what's going on? I asked, opening the conversation. You all do such a professional job, but sales are down. Any ideas? I wish I knew, said one of the younger salespeople. This is killing me. I might not even be able to continue to work here if I don't start landing some sales. I'm in the same boat, another chimed in. Something has got to change or I won't make it. Everyone in the group shook their heads. What are you doing differently now from where you were six months ago, I asked. I don't think it is anything we are doing. We have just been getting better, a salesperson named Jonathan said passionately. We are better. We are tighter with our scripts and our pricing and how we overcome objections. We are getting after it. We are like sales machines, but things are just going backward. Machines. This was the second time I had heard the sales team referred to as machines. I noticed it, but it still didn't make sense to me. If you are doing everything perfectly, then what are you doing wrong? I asked. The table sat quiet for a minute. Finally, one of the most senior salespeople, VJ, spoke up. That's what we're doing wrong. What? I asked. That, he said. We are doing everything perfectly like machines, like robots. Boom. It hit me. Right there. VJ was right. Too perfect? What do you mean by that? Asked one of the other salespeople. I listened to VJ intently to see if he was saying what I was thinking. I mean we do everything too perfectly. We read the script. We answer the questions. We overcome objections. We stick to the pricing model. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you made a person laugh on the other end of the phone? VJ questioned the group. Nothing but blank faces from the whole team. Their silence made the answer obvious. No one had gotten a laugh from a potential client in a long time. So then what kind of connection are you making with them? I asked. Exactly, VJ said. None. Is it possible that in the pursuit of perfection, you all have become too perfect? You have become machines, robots? I asked. And we all know what you do with a robo-sales call. Click, you hang up, VJ said. He was right. That was it. In trying to boost sales, the leadership team had done what they thought was right. They went default aggressive to implement highly disciplined standard operating procedures. And in doing so, they went too far and took away the freedom of their salespeople to adapt on the front lines. Instead of adapting to a potential customer's reaction and making some kind of connection, the salespeople were stuck giving the same script over and over and over again. As good as they were at reading the script, and as convincing as they sounded, it didn't matter if they couldn't have a real conversation with the potential client. And that wasn't the only problem. As I dug down, I found other issues. Because flexibility had been eliminated from the pricing structure, the frontline salespeople couldn't do anything to close deals that had potential but needed a little nudge to get them over the line. Without the ability to offer a special discount or the power to maneuver on price in any way, the salespeople often had to let interested customers walk. Finally, with the minimum number of calls per day increased and strictly enforced, the salespeople gave up too easily during their calls. If they got one indication that they weren't going to get a deal, they would move on to the next call so they could meet the minimum number of calls required and not be penalized. 
This was the opposite of what they explained worked better. Taking time with a potential client to explain details and build a relationship, thereby increasing the possibility of closing the sale. With this feedback and information, I went back to the VP of sales and talked her through the problem and the solution. Too much discipline, she asked with a big smile on her face. I never thought I'd hear you say that, Jocko. I don't say it too often, I explained, knowing I deserved some ribbing since I touted the benefits of discipline with such regularity. Because usually discipline is what's lacking. But here, the balance has shifted too far in the other direction. The frontline troops don't have the freedom to make things happen, to maneuver on the battlefield, to adjust and adapt to the situation on the ground, or in this case, the situation on the phone. They aren't making any connections with potential clients. They are responding like robots, with no power to offer any pricing concessions to a tough prospect. And with the strictly enforced minimum calls they are required to make, they are being even more transactional on their calls, exactly what they shouldn't be. You're a master salesperson. How would it impact you if you had to stay on script 100% of the time, I asked. She was quiet for a moment as the reality settled in. It would be very hard to close sales, she admitted. And I should have known that. Every salesperson is different, and so is every customer and every call. The ability to connect over the phone is paramount, and I took that ability away from them. It's my fault, and I need to own it. I smiled. Yes, you do, I agreed. That's extreme ownership. And it works not because you say you own it, but because now you will take ownership of solving the problem. Yes, I will, she said. Over the next few days, we worked on a new plan and training program that emphasized not reading a script, but creating a connection with the potential customer, the person on the other end of the line. On top of that, the company shifted its metrics. They began tracking not the number of outbound calls, but the total time spent on the phone with potential customers to help drive good conversations that should translate into more sales. Finally, they loosened the pricing structure, giving more freedom to the salespeople to accommodate interested prospects and get deals closed. The VP of sales rolled out the plan very quickly and saw the numbers rapidly improve. Balance between discipline and freedom had been achieved, for now, and things were back on track.